If you want to turn your Bibles to the book of Leviticus, if you're using this Bible on the way in, it's page 99. We're flying, we're flying. Page 99. If you need a Bible, take it. It's our gift to you, but don't panic. If you don't have a Bible in your hands, we've got all the verses. They'll be up here. You'll be able to follow along on all the different screens all over here, okay? But uh, we, sh I showed, we showed the harvest video for a, a reason today. It's the perfect fit for what we're going to be talking about here in Leviticus. The, uh, if you are online watching the sermon somewhere at some point, go back and watch the whole service to catch the, the whole video of that. But it's a perfect fit. We do, our church does support harvest. And I tell all the churches to support them. And we have lots of individuals supporting them. So uh, just an amazing ministry. I'll talk more about them at the end, okay? But the title today is G Living in an X-Rated World. Uh, some people are very nervous. I know they already warned, you know, said, are we going to be banned? Well, maybe, but we're going to still preach the word. G Living in an X-Rated World, Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, especially Leviticus 19.2. Now, we, we've been doing a foundational testament series. We're going to go from Genesis through Malachi, a week or two in each book. Okay, we've been doing that. We already did Genesis. Help me out. Creation, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. Then we did Exodus let my people go. Good. I, somebody remembered, let my people go. you got to memorize all. We're going to be able to go through all 39 books of the foundational testament, right? And then we did Exodus 3, 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Remember that one? And now today, Leviticus. And the theme for Leviticus is holiness. So I do a little halo. Ho get my arm up. <laughs> it's working better. Holiness. Holiness. Do the halo. All right. And Leviticus 19, 2. Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now Leviticus, the word Leviticus comes from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the foundational testament. And it means relating to the Levites. Leviticus relating to the Levites. That's the priestly tribe. That was the tribe God picked to, to, to function as the priest. They were the priests who led the worship of Jehovah God. Leviticus lays out God's direction for that worship and also ceremonial clean, cleanliness, moral laws, holy days. But it's all about worship. But the underlying, underlying foundation of the book, really, the real true foundation is holiness. Holiness. Holiness means to be, yep, set apart. Very good. Set apart it means to be set apart. God set them apart. It means to be set apart, to be different from the world. They were, we're called to be different from the world. We're called to be like God. We're called to be holy. Leviticus 19.2, be holy. Why don't you pop, move that up one level, one level there to 19.2. Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Holiness, that's what we're called to be. But this wasn't just for the Israelites in, in the foundational testament. This is also meant for us who are living in the fulfilled testament, who live in Matthew through Revelation. We're still called to that same holy call that was given to the Israelites. In fact, in 1 Peter 2 9, look at connect the dots here. In 1 Peter 2 9, he says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. A holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We, we are the Levites, spiritual Levites today. We are called to be that. We are called to be God's priests now. The priesthood of all believers is a vital truth in God's word, a vital truth. This is meant for us today. And we're going to look at holiness in Leviticus today, and we're going to especially focus on G living in an X-rated world. And I better pray first. All right, here we go. Father, we thank you for the worship. We thank you for the powerful video from Harvest. We thank you for everyone who's here or out there somewhere watching. We pray that you would convict us, bring us to repentance, bring us to sanctification, Lord, we want to be holy like you are. I pray for everyone's freedom and healing, even if it takes a lifetime. Pray for that freedom and healing through your mercy and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so... 
the title, we live in an X-rated world, right? I mean, you know, we can't escape it. It's like, I tell people all the time, it's like breathing pollution. You know, you just, you know how you breathe, you breathe pollution, you can't stop it, you just, because this is where we live. We, it's like breathing pollution. It's everywhere, it's on TV, it's in the movies, it's on our phones, it's on our computers, it's in the Olympic opening, you know, ceremony, you know? It, it's everywhere, in fact, the Babylon Bee said it best. I, I love how they, if you don't read the Babylon Bee every morning, you're missing out, all right? But Babylon B said, Sodom and Gomorrah set to host 2028 Olympics. <laughs> In keeping with the Olympic, Olympics commitment to sexual violence and Satan worship, the International Olympic Committee announced today that the 2028 games would be held in the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's funny, but it's not, right? Like, because the whole country's turning to Sodom and Gomorrah, isn't it? But you, we, can't, we just can't escape it. it. It's everywhere, right? And, and guess what? We think it's bad, but guess what? The Israelites had it pretty bad, too. They lived in the land of Egypt, the, the, which they just, were just, just had left. The Jews were just leaving that. That was a perverse place. And they were heading to the land of Canaan, which was even more depraved. So we, they knew, God knew, Exactly. That's why God was going to use it, the Israelites to wipe them out. But God knew exactly what they were coming from and where they were going and how they needed to be holy. But that they were so wicked, the Canaanites, that that's why God had sent the Israelites to wipe them out. In Genesis, God promised Abraham the land of Canaan, the promised land. But he said, you're going to have to wait for my time. In Genesis 15, 6, he said this. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. When a nation hits its limit of wickedness, God acts. God acts. And that's scary for the USA today, isn't it? Terrifying, because I believe we're on the edge of a cliff. An edge of a cliff. By the time Joshua, which we're going to hit in a few weeks, by the time Joshua crossed the Jordan to take the people into the Promised Land, the Canaanites' cup was completely full, completely full. They were sacrificing their firstborn to their Baals and Moloch, their idols, the Baals and Moloch, both. They were sacrificing their firstborn. Their sexual sins were so sick that I can't even say what it was like from the pulpit. But I will say this. There's a reason why God said kill every man, woman, child, and animal when they got to some of these Canaanite cities. There is, there is a reason why. Because they shared the same sexual diseases. That's all I'm going to say. It was bad. And once again, terrifying for the USA today. Terrifying. That is the context of God's call to holiness in Leviticus. That's the context of what was going on. And in Leviticus 19.2, he says, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. That is right in the middle of chapters 18 to 20, which focuses on holiness and God's holiness, especially sexual holiness it focuses on. And that's the hardest one. In the USA today, it seems like mission impossible, right? But it, all things are possible with God, sexual holiness. Uh, just I'll, let's pick it up with Leviticus 18, verse 1, <clears throat> where he says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I'm bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. Don't be like the Egyptians or the Canaanites. In Egypt, like I said, perverse. The pharaohs, just the pharaohs themselves, married their, their sisters and their daughters. If you've ever read the life of Cleopatra, you know what was going on in Egypt. Sick. But the archaeologists, Canaan was even worse. The archaeologists, when they first went into Canaan, this was years ago, now 60 years ago, when they went in and studied and uncovered what had happened in Canaan before Israel had gotten there, and even after, unfortunately, after they got there, they were traumatized. They couldn't even publish their works. They were traumatized what they found in the land of Canaan, the archaeologists. It was crazy. Uh, let's, let's move on here with, with what God is saying to them in verse 6. 
He says, no one is to have approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am the Lord. Do not dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. Do not have relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your father's wife. That would dishonor your father. Do not have sexual relations with your sister, either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in the same home or elsewhere. Do not have sexual relations with your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter. That would dishonor you. Do not have sexual relations with the daughter of your father's wife. Born to your father, she is your sister. Do not have sexual relations with your father's sister. She is your father's close relative. Do not have sexual relations with your mother's sister because she is your mother's close relative. Do not dishonor your father's brother by approaching his wife to have sexual relations. She is your aunt. Do not have sexual relations with your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. Do not have relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. That would dishonor your brother. Do not have sexual relations with both a woman and her daughter. Do not have sexual relations with either her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter. They are close relatives. That is wickedness. Do not take your wife's sister as a rival wife and have sexual relations with with her while your wife is living. Do not approach a woman to have sexual relations during the uncleanness of her monthly period. Do not have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife and defile yourself with her. Sounds like I'm describing the USA Today, doesn't it? It, the, the movies and the media glorifies that list, doesn't it? It glorifies that, that sinful list. The, the demonic porn that is swept our country in every way conditions men, women, and children to act on these very things. And look what God connects it all to in Leviticus 18.21. The very next verse, he says, Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Moloch, for you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. It's connected to child sacrifice. Why would it be right in the middle of this section, Moloch and child sacrifice? Because the worship of Baal, the Baals and Moloch, involved sexual orgies and child sacrifice. That's what was, that's what was part of their worship, just massive sexual orgies and child sacrifice. Why? Because they're connected, <laughs> just like today. They're, they're totally connected. Uh, the, our, our Secretary of Transportation, just last week, Buttigieg, uh, he was arguing why, why we should vote pro-choice. He was arguing why everybody should be voting for a certain candidate who thinks it's okay to kill babies, pro-choice, right? And he said, this was his argument, abortion makes men more free. That's why, because abortion makes men more free. And you know what? He's right. It's true. It sets them free to live like animals, right? It sets them free. Listen, you know, I, I grew up on a, a, a farm. This all reminds what I'm seeing everywhere reminds me of the barnyard. I've seen all this years ago in the barnyard, but now it's here. College campuses, it's here. It's like a big barnyard. You live free. And look what's next in the sinful progression. There's no accident with this. Verse 22. Leviticus 18.22, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Remember Romans 1, the progression in sexual sin, the heterosexual to the homosexual to the depraved mind. To the, it's a progression. Remember Romans 1. If you didn't hear my Romans 1 series, go back and listen to it. Uh, this is scary for the United States today because we are immersed in the demonic LGBTQ movement. And it is demonic. The goal is for everyone to be fluid in gender and sexuality. Completely fluid in gender and sexuality. The schools are pushing this on our children. I want to say something. I've had 10 children graduate from public school. I'm going to say this. Get your kids out now. Get them out now. What if you walked in to the room and they were one of your kids was watching TV, and on the TV they were telling kids to, uh, that there are many genders, there's 12 different genders, uh, they're even beyond that now here in our local school, there's 12 genders, and they were showing on the TV sex acts for children that you could do with other children, the sex acts you could do, and even creep in with some adult men in the same thing. What would you do? You'd say, shut that off right now! What are you watching that for? Well, guess what? 
They're teaching that in the schools. There are books in the library with everything you can imagine in the schools. The teachers are pushing it in the schools. The administrations are pushing it. Get your kids out now. Or at the very least, you better be on top of it. And a lot of parents say, when I tell them what they're teaching in our school, they I can't believe, my kids have never said anything. <gasps> they know. I know why they aren't telling me. Because they, they are going like a crazy woman and confront the administration. They're not telling you. But it, it's happening from kindergarten all the way up to graduation. Get them out now. It, 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 it's crazy. Uh, and then notice the progression and the perversity. This is crazier and crazier. Verse 23, do not have sexual relations with a woman. I'm sorry, with an animal. Do not have sexual relations with an animal. I blurred something there. And defile yourself with it. Oh, there it is. A woman must not present herself to an animal to have sexual relations with it. That is a perversion, a perversion. There is a movement in the United States today to legalize sex with animals. There's a big push. A big push. And you say, no, that would never happen. Well, I remember as a kid when adultery and, and, and premarital sex was wrong. And nobody even, you know, if you, nobody did those things. Not, not with con being condoned, not pushed. And then we saw that pushed and, and okayed and thumbs up by our culture. And then it went to homosexuality. And, and it, be, no, it went to homo homosexuality, which was so bad, also became a virtue. And, 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 and then when that happened, I remember saying to people, the day will come when they're going to legalize sex with children. Everybody's like, no, that's sick. That's sick. No, but it, it's happening now. The American Psychiatric Association has already removed the stigma. There's already a movement that, you know, there's a big movement. They call it now not pedophilia, but intergenerational intimacy. And everybody should have a right to it. And they're pushing it. I'm telling you, it's coming. And it's not far off till we see the sex with animals okayed. There's already a push. If you've ever had any, you know, it's all over the pornography already. And if you read the stories, a lot of people in our country are practicing it. And they're not even, they're not even uh, arresting them anymore for it. it. It's very, very common. It's crazy, but that is the progression, the progression. And then Leviticus 18 ends with a warning. Leviticus 18, verse 24. Do not defile yourself in any of these ways, because this is how the nations I'm going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and my laws. The native-born and the foreigners residing among you must not do any of these detestable things. For all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. And Israel did not listen. And they were vomited. They paid the price for their idolatry and their sin. And I believe the USA is headed today toward that same judgment. There has to be a massive repentance because we are facing revival or judgment and we may have already crossed the line. There are serious consequences for sin, for all sin, but especially for sexual sin. There are very serious consequences. Look at, let's look at the consequences in Leviticus 20. Leviticus 20, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, Any Israelite or foreigner residing in Israel who sacrifices any of his children to Moloch is to be put to death. Put to death. The members of the community are to stone him. Leviticus 20, verse 6. I will set my face against anyone who turns to mediums and spiritists to prostitute themselves by following them, and I will cut them off from their people. Very, very serious consequences for sin. But let's look at the sexual sin. Very, very serious the same way. In verse uh, 10. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. Verse 11, if a man has sexual relations with his father's wife, he has dishonored his father. Both the man and the woman are to be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. Verse 12, if a man has sexual relations with his daughter-in-law, both of them are to be put to death. What they have done is a perversion. Their blood will be on their own heads. 
Verse 13, if a man has sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They are to be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. Verse 14, if a man marries both a woman and her mother, it is wicked. Both he and they must be burned in the fire so that no wickedness will be among you. Why would God demand stoning for sexual sin? Why would he do that? Doesn't that seem harsh? Why would he do that? Because sexual sin is very, very serious. In fact, remember 1 Corinthians 6, 9, where it says this. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but whoever sins sexually sins against his own body body. Very, very serious. Then he says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Sexual sin is very, very serious. Uh, did I miss one verse? You're about, uh, oh no, I got it. Okay, good. Uh, very, very serious. Stoning to death is a physical picture. When they stoned them, there was a physical picture of a spiritual reality. Do you understand that? It's a physical picture of a spiritual reality. Sin, all sin, but especially sexual sin, cuts us off from God. It cuts us off. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says this, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Do you not know that the wrongdoers, the, the other versions say the wicked will inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's a the, the, the physical picture is a spiritual reality. Sexual sin, all sin on that list, but s focusing on the sexual sin right now, causes us to be cut off from God. Look what it says. It will not inherit the kingdom of God. Cut, gonna go to hell. That's what it's saying. Going to go to hell. It, sexual sin cuts us off. All sin does. Look at that list. All sin cuts us off, right? All sin cuts us off from a relationship with God here. And then it also kills any chance that we could have for an, an eternal relationship. It condemns us to an eternity in hell, permanently separated from God after we die. That's what sin does. This is what this verse just told us. Do not, uh, back to verse 9. Look at this list. Do, not, do you not know that the wicked wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, or, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. We, you, it, it completely, when we sin, I'm not talking about if we struggle with sin, I'm saying we fall to us and not saying we sin and say, God, please forgive me. I can't believe I did it. Forgive me, help me, help me. Mercy and grace, mercy and grace. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, this is talking about people who say this is who I am. I'm an adulterer. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm a homosexual. That's my identity. I have pride in that. I, uh, you know, I'm a, a, a thief. I steal. They're, they're, I, our identity is that's who we are, and we will not repent of that. And that's what it's talking about. And we, have, we can have no relationship with God now or for eternity. I know many people living in unrepentive, sinful lifestyles. Everything on that list, and you could add to it. We could all could add to that, right? Think of our lives, right? Uh, but who think, these people will talk to me and say, I'm very close to God. I have a close relationship. I talk to Jesus all the time. And, and I tell you, you have an emotional delusion. You, God, you have, you have, God is not hearing a word you're saying. And whatever warm feeling you're feeling is, is a demonic spirit at best. That, that, and, and I know many other people say, I'm going to go to heaven because I've been, I'm good. I, I know I have, I'm, I'm living one of those lives, but, but I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to heaven. And I tell them, you're in for the shock of your life and it's going to last for all of eternity because this is what God's word says. Unrepentant sin cuts us off completely from God. That's what that passage tells us. But thankfully, there's another verse. There's a verse right after that. And it says this. And that's what some of you, verse 11, and that's what some of you were. 
but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's what we, no matter what, listen, no matter what you are this very moment, it can be what you were, what you were. We can all be, no matter what, we could add a lot to that list, couldn't we? Everybody in our church, we could add many things to that list, couldn't we? It's, it's what we were because we can be <clears throat> washed. We can be sanctified, set apart. We can be justified just as if I never sinned. That's what can happen in our life. And we can have that through faith in Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. The moment you say, God, I repent of my sin, I turn away from it. I ask for your mercy and grace through your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for me. The moment you do that, I give my life to Jesus. The moment you do that, it's no longer who you are. It's who you were, the way you were. It's who you were. You're a brand new person in Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus came to this planet, Earth, to die for us, to sacrifice himself, to pay for our sin to, so we could be washed by his blood. That's why he came to do it. In Leviticus 11, verse 1, it says this. I'm sorry, in Leviticus 1, verse 1, it says, The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of the meeting. He said, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When anyone among you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. If the offspring is a burnt offering from the herd, you are to offer a male without defect. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. You are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. They would bring this lamb, put its head on, hand on its head. The priest would slit its throat. The Levite would slit its throat. And that blood would make atonement at one meant, make them at one with God again. And when they did that, they were looking forward to, by faith, to the ultimate lamb. In 1 Peter 1.18, it says this, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you, from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus was that lamb. We're redeemed from sin. We're redeemed from Satan, redeemed from an eternity in hell. We're redeemed by putting our faith in Jesus Christ in that lamb who is without blemish or defect, the perfect son of God who died on the cross in our place. Jesus paid that price on the cross when he died for us. And, and he proved it by rising from the dead. Jesus paid that price. He was our ransom. He redeemed us. He ransomed us. He was our substitute. He took our place. You, you know, these all these, what's on the all the news all the time is these captives being held by Hamas and, and will they ever be released and many of them are being killed you know, every day they're dying, dying uh, it, it's, it's so sad what's happening to them but, but they keep talking about this prisoner exchange but you know what I can tell you what would bring them home immediately if Netanyahu said I will exchange those prisoners those captives hostages for my son. He has a son living in the United States. I believe he's right here right now. I will trade my son for them. Do you think they would take that? You better believe it. They would take it and set them all free. And that's exactly what God did for us. He traded his one and only son to set us free. Because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice for us, we can live New lives, now and forever. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Is The moment you put your faith in Jesus, you are a brand new creation, sinless. 
in God's sight. Positionally, not practically, we're battling. But positionally, sinless in God's sight. He only sees the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He doesn't see how bad we've messed up. What a mess we are still. He sees his own son, Jesus Christ, his righteousness. Are you in Jesus Christ? How do we get there? How do we get there? We have to repent of our sin and put our faith in Jesus. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Have you ever believed in Jesus Christ? The word means to put your faith in, your complete trust in. It, it, it involves repenting of sin biblically and putting your complete trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to make you at one with God. Have you ever done that? You can do that today. You can do it right now while we're, while, well, even before we pray. You can do that. And as Christians, are we living this new life? Are we living this new life? That's why we were washed, sanctified, justified, so that we could live out the life that God has, has, has prepared us for. We could live out God's purpose for our life. We could be holy, which is the whole point. We are now, we are now fulfilling Leviticus. That's our call to do. In fact, in 1 Peter 2, 5, we did 2, 9, look at 2, 5. It says this, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Leviticus, a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Spiritual sacrifices. We're not called to sacrifice a lamb anymore. We're called to offer a spiritual sacrifice. And we do that by living out our purpose of being a holy priesthood, offering a spiritual sacrifice. And what does that look like? In Romans 12.1, remember Romans? In Romans 12.1 where it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Worship. That's how we offer it, by living that holy life, living for Jesus. And then he says in verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's how we do it. And maybe you're here today, and maybe you are broken by sin. We all are. We all, we, if you're here today, you are broken by sin. We are all broken by sin, right? But listen, I want to encourage you to get your healing Get your healing. Claim your freedom in Jesus Christ. Get your healing. Claim your freedom. Get it. Get, get your healing. Putting our faith in Jesus Christ is a one-time event. You do it once. We're made a new creation. But sanctification takes a lifetime. Practical sanctification. Salvation is a one-time event, but sanctification takes a lifetime. We won't ever be fully free or fully healed till we get to heaven. But we're called to keep working to that. And maybe you're here today and you need healing. Get your healing. Maybe you're here today and you're sexually broken. You need God's mercy and grace. You are in the right place. <laughs> Whatever your struggle in life is, you're in the right place. We got it all covered here, right? Uh, we, have, we have lots of people one-to-one. -one. All you have to do is talk to me or talk to Kim and say, hey, this is my struggle. This is it. Connect me. We'll get you connected with a group. We'll connect you with a person. We'll connect you somewhere. We'll help you ourselves. We Believe me, you will not. No matter what it is. You cannot shock Pastor Chuck. Believe me. I know what I am, and I know what many of you, and we've had, you've heard the testimonies. But we have lots of ways to get healing. Think of sexually. We have a sexual purity group, which is awesome. We have one to, people meet one-to-one, -one, men, women, teens. Teens, talk to your youth leaders. Uh, Sarah and Mark just starting over starting the youth group this week. Uh, you can tell them anything you're struggling with. They'll understand. They'll help you. We have uh, Pure Life Ministries. One of our young men is down there now. Been totally transformed. It's awesome. Pure Life Ministries down in Kentucky. 
Milwaukee. We send folks down there on a regular basis. Uh, Harvest USA, which you, we showed the video earlier. Uh, the, the, the website is Harvest harvestusa.org. I think we have that uh, slide. Here it is. Harvestusa.org. You can meet in person with them. You can Zoom with them. You can get support for wives, parents, everybody. Reach out for help. Me, our church, Harvest, so, uh, reach out for help just on Harvest's website. I'm just going to read a couple things just on their website. The, uh, look, look what they help folks with. Pornography, transgenderism, spousal unfaithfulness. I'm reading their website. A struggling child, same-sex attraction, singleness and dating, relationship struggles, biblical sexuality, sexual addiction, marriage discipleship, helping others, uh, technology protection plan, sexual integrity support groups, Woo. Uh, other online courses, which Mark had mentioned on the video, raising sexually faithful kids, parenting boys and girls in a gender-confused world. Then it's a, there's another part on your call, get help for yourself. Men, women, wives, parents, families, they got it all covered. But, but my point is there's help for everybody no matter what our struggle is. Whatever it is, I want to encourage you to get your healing, get your freedom. It's a long, hard battle, but we're going to get there by God's mercy and grace. Let's pray. How is God convicting us today? How is he speaking to us, calling us to healing, calling us to freedom in Christ, calling us to holiness? How is God speaking to us? If you're already a Christian, would your prayer be, God, every day, make me more holy? I want my healing. I want my freedom in Jesus Christ. And maybe if something's got you by the throat and you cannot get free, I want to encourage you to commit to God right now. Say, God, I'm going to share this with somebody here or harvest or somewhere. I'm going to share this. I'm going to break this, the power of this secret by sharing with someone who I can trust, who can help me find my healing. Commit to that right now. If you can't find anybody to talk to, talk to me. I will help you get to the right help. Maybe here, Tim, you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. You, you've never taken that first step to real life, but today could be that day. It happens in your heart. You may have already prayed it in your heart, but the, I'm going to encourage you to put your faith in Jesus Christ right now, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, right now, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You can have that life right now. It doesn't start in heaven someday. It starts right now. Real life. The simple prayer of faith. God, I repent. I repent of all my sin. Everything in my life that goes against your holy word. I ask you to forgive me. Because I'm putting my faith in your one and only son, Jesus Christ. who died on the cross for me, for my sin, so his blood could wash me. I put my faith in Jesus. In Jesus who rose from the dead to prove he has power to give me a new life. I give my life to Jesus. If you have put your faith in Jesus, the Bible teaches that he will send his Holy Spirit into you. Even now, the Holy Spirit is in you. The power of the Holy Spirit. 
has entered your very soul and made you a new creation in Christ. And you can never sin the same way again. You're going to hate it. You're going to, you might, you could go to it, but it's not going to satisfy you ever again. Because you're in Jesus now. You're going to have conviction. You're going to be miserable in sin. We're supposed to be. Because the Holy Spirit wants us to be set free. If you've put your faith in Jesus, I want to encourage you to tell somebody today. Maybe you have a family member, friend here. Tell me on the way out. Fill out the cards, stick in the box. Email me, nhcc at comcast.net for those who are out there somewhere. Tell somebody, somebody at work, somebody at school. Tell somebody, your neighbor who's been witnessing to you. Tell somebody so that we can be excited for you and help you in your new life of sanctification in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit in a powerful way on each one of us. A, a, your spirit of sanctification, of holiness, of real life, we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.